thank you so, so much, Skills for Change. You do amazing work out there. I am an immigrant, and I do understand from first-hand experience how important it is for people who are new to Planet Canada to realize how gravity works around here. So thank you so, so much for everything you do. I was born in 1965 in Tehran, Iran, and back then Iran was not an Islamic Republic as it is today. We had a king and we called him the Shah. Now, I grew up in a middle class family. I lived in downtown Tehran, not unlike Queen Street or Bloor Street. And when I looked out of my window at an apartment on top of a furniture store, I saw a four-lane street with a lot of cars, a lot of beautiful shops, women going about doing their business, men going about doing their thing. And the majority of women, even though 98% of the population of Iran was Muslim, they wore tight t-shirts and miniskirts because back then Iran had secular laws and women were allowed to dress the way they wanted. If they wanted to cover up, that was fine. If they didn't want to, that was fine as well. And according to Iranian law back then, which was very secular, Women could become whatever they want. We got back from the cottage in 1978. It had been a wonderful, beautiful summer, and there was a tank parked at my door. People have asked me, what did you feel? What did you think? Well, I really felt nothing, and I thought nothing, because, I mean, I was a six, I, I was a 13-year-old that had grown up dancing to the Bee Gees. I had never, ever seen a tank before. I didn't even know what it was exactly. So I asked my mom, what's that? And she said, it's a tank. And I said, oh, are they shooting a movie? No, it was not a movie. It was real. And I watched from my window in the heart of downtown Tehran as the revolution unfolded. The street would fill with literally millions of people to the point that you couldn't see the pavement. And they would yelling and screaming slogans against the East and the West, against everybody. And I couldn't understand where this anger and hatred was coming from. But people were obviously angry. So I asked a friend of mine what's going on. He was 18 and he knew everything. So he said, well, you know, where have you been? I mean, the Shah is a dictator. And I had to ask, what's a dictator? And he said, if you do anything against the government, if you speak against the government, you're going to be arrested, tortured, and maybe even executed. It was news to me. I had no idea. I had lived in a closed society. But I had had my Donny Osmond and my Jane Austen and, you know, all the fun that I needed to have. I didn't care if I lived in a political dictatorship. Like, do you think a 13-year-old would really care? No, I didn't. I had what I wanted. But the people were obviously very upset, and the slogans had turned to death to America, death to Israel, basically death to everybody. Um, and the revolution was gathering momentum. Now, I'm going to give you a footnote here. I don't think too many people here have actually lived through a revolution. There has never been a revolution in the history of mankind where, you know, things just go 100%. There hasn't been. There are always bumps in the road, and some, sometimes those bumps are very, very big ones. Now, horror in history, how does it happen? So, does it just happen overnight? Is it that you go to bed tonight, and tomorrow you have Hitler, Stalin, Mao, or Khomeini on your hands? No. It happens little by little. The wave of arrest of young people began in 1981 in spring. I was arrested on January 15, 1982 at about 9, 10 o'clock at night. I was about to take a bath, the doorbell rang, my mom called my name, and I opened the bathroom door and there were two big guns pointed in my face. People have asked me, were you scared? No, I was not, and that's not because I'm brave. I'm not brave at all. Those who play video games, they know that you can pick up body armor and then you become invincible to bullets. Well, I entered a state of shock. A state of shock is body armor, but it doesn't protect you against bullets. It protects you against emotion. So I became incapable of feeling. My mom and dad were crying, and I was looking at them, and I was thinking, why are you crying? No big deal. I'm getting arrested. I was 16 years old. I didn't get it. I was in a state of shock. So the guards put me in a the car. They drove me north to a prison, a large prison in north of Tehran. It is a compound. A big part of it is underground, and right now it has about 7,000 prisoners. It hasn't changed much at all. 
and I was blindfolded upon arrival. I was taken in, walked along hallway after hallway. Eventually, I was made to sit down. Somebody came, called my name. His name was Ali, and he took me in a room for interrogation, and he asked me questions. I couldn't see him. I was blindfolded. And he asked me, have you attended protest rallies against the government? I said, yes, because uh, there was no need to hide it. Everybody knew I attended protest rallies. I went to protest rallies with my friends after school every day. The principal knew it, the teachers knew it, my parents knew it, the shopkeepers knew it, everybody knew it. It was common knowledge. And then he asked me, have you written articles against the government? I said, yeah, I had written articles in my school newspaper about the taking away of our liberties, yes. And then he asked me, where is Sharslot? Sharslot is a girl's name. I had met with this young woman once. She was a university student. She was a member of a Marxist group. She wanted me to join them. And I said no to her. Because at that point, I had figured out that Marxism and Catholicism don't exactly go well together. And not only that, I had realized that at that point in time, Iran may be you know, working with a Marxist organization, even if we, we could put our ideological differences aside, which we probably could. So they took me to another room, and they took off my uh, blindfold, and I was in a small room with two men, Ali and Hamid, and there was a desk, uh, two chairs, um, and a bare wooden bed. They asked me again, where is Shahzad? I said, I don't know, which was the absolute truth. And they handcuffed me. They realized my hands are going to slide out of the cuffs. They don't make, make handcuffs for 16-year-old girls. I was 95 pounds back then. Now they make them adjustable. Back then, no. So my hands were going to slide out of the cuffs. So they put both of my wrists together, and they put the two in one cuff. And as it clicked, my right wrist cracked. Now, the torture had not even begun yet. And at that point, if I knew where this girl was, I would have told with what cream on top. If the devil had appeared, and I'm a Catholic girl, if the devil had appeared and had said, Marina, sell me your soul, I'm going to get you back to your mommy, I would have sold my soul and I would have gone home to my mom. I would have done anything. If I knew where she was, anything I would have shared with this man. But they just didn't believe me. And then they tied me to the bare wooden bed. I was lying down my stomach and they lashed the soles of my feet with a length of cake. Now, uh, those of you who have gone for reflexology, you know how amazing it is? Imagine the opposite. Your nerve ends are in your feet. With every strike of the lash, your nervous system explodes, then it's magically put, that back, put back together, and then you're wide awake for the next. 80 countries around the world right now, more than 80 countries, they use torture actively. And there are many others who use information that come from torture, many of them democratic. And those who use it, and those who use the information, they will tell you that torture is designed to get information. They lie. Torture is designed to break the human soul. When they succeed, they stop. They don't succeed, they will execute you. Don't forget that torture is not designed to kill people. People do die under torture, but it's accidental. Because torture is hard work. If they want to kill you, why would they torture you? Why would they bother? They would just put you in front of a firing squad or they would hang you. Or they would stone you. There are different ways. So, no. Torture aims at destroying the human soul. So they beat me and beat me and beat me and eventually they stop and I sat up and I looked at my feet and I laughed out loud. I burst out laughing. They were like overgrown party balloons, color blue with toes on them. My death sentence, I was lucky it was reduced to life in prison. Back then, we had mass executions every night because there were thousands of prisoners in a prison built for a few hundred. So there were people being killed every night, but there were those of us who survived. I was sent to the cell block, and the first night I woke up at 2 a.m., I looked around me, I needed to go to the bathroom. And I got up, and I thought, uh-oh. I was in a small cell with about 60 people, and then there was the hallway, and then down the hallway there was a bathroom. There were people sleeping everywhere on the floor. I couldn't find space between them to put my foot down to make it to the bathroom, and I can't walk on air. So I thought, okay, forget. I discovered my humanity in the bathroom line in Emin Prison. What is it? It's your happy memories. It's the memory of the people whom you love and the memory of the people who love you. So, that's what we talked about. 
I carry the memories of every girl who ever stood in a bathroom line with me. Many of them are buried in mass graves. And I'm standing here. I'm a survivor and I'm a witness. And if I don't speak about this, if I don't tell you about this, my life becomes meaningless. And I'm not going to allow that because this is the only card that I still have in my hand. And I can play it and I hope to play it well. It's not going to change the past. It's not going to change what happened to those girls. But maybe, maybe it can change, maybe, in some miraculous way. And I have faith in that because miracles do happen. That Antonella's husband comes home one day. Not all of the 7,000, but even if one person comes home, that is a victory. It's one life saved. Take democracy seriously. Take this country seriously. Be involved with it and give it your best. And I promise you, if someone like me, I didn't even manage to enter university because they didn't let me in. I went to the School of Continuing Studies at U of T here. I got a certificate in creative writing. But in Canada, my experience is that it is a, if you give it your best, if you stand up for what you believe in, if you use your voice, I and mean, if you encourage your neighbors and your friends to do exactly the same thing, maybe, just maybe, we can maintain what we have, and not only that, we can make it better. Thank you so much for your time. Give us some insight into what kept you going, you know, for that two years. What what was it that, that just kept you going and, and didn't allow you to crack? You know, I think survival, my experience tells me from what I saw, not only in myself, but in my fellow prisoners, because there were hundreds of us, and 90% of us in Ebbing prison back then, we were teenagers. So what I saw in my fellow inmates was that survival is coded in your DNA. If somebody throws you in a swimming pool and you don't know how to swim, you're not just going to sink and drown and say, hey, I give up. You're going to kick and scream and you're going to do the best you can and hope that help will arrive and that you can stay afloat for just long enough until help gets there. That's what you do. So survival is encoded in our DNA. We normally do it. We go into survival mode. Now, in some people it's broken, but it is rare. We had people in Evin prison who psychologically lost it. We had people in any prison who committed suicide, but it was extremely rare. Most people held it together because you, as a human being, there is a part of you that despite all evidence, hopes. Hope, what is, what is it made of? I cannot tell you. I do believe in God. So because I do believe in God, I do believe that there is something beyond this electrical currents in our body and in our brains. There is something beyond that, that despite all evidence and all logic, it tells you that, you know what, just keep on going. So, you know, once you go through a trauma like that, it's a never-ending battle. Because that post-traumatic stress disorder, there's no cure for it, there's no such thing as closure, don't even waste your time, it's the most stupid word in the English dictionary, there is no such thing. So don't waste your time, find a way to deal with it. And I find the best way to deal with trauma is engage. Don't run. You run the other way, there is an elastic band around your waist, you can't even see it. You're running and trauma that is around your waist is pulling you. And then at a certain point, it's going to pull you right back into that wall. And then you're going to explode into little smithereens. So don't run. Do the exact opposite. You know, do it against, do it against your logic. Because your electrical currents in your body are telling you run, but no. Do the opposite. Stop, turn back, and engage it. Look at the trauma in the eye and tell it, I know you, I see you, and I'm not afraid of you, and I'm going to stand up to you.